All right. Welcome, Robert. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hi. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be sort of part of technology for a long time, from the 18 years I had at Microsoft, where I worked across the five core divisions. Um, this gave me kind of a unique opportunity to see things both from the devices side, which Microsoft was actually nascent in, um, as well as the software side. And participate in kind of some of the revolutions um, that have happened. So the real desktop revolution was the first one, then the internet happened. Um, after that, you know, we saw the first phase of the device revolution and uh, that laid some of the groundwork um, for, for what was going to happen when mobile actually really struck. And, um, and then cloud, of course, uh, and then the real mobile revolution. And uh, I'd left Microsoft for Amazon at that point, but it was really, you know, a great chance for me to see when I came to Microsoft, actually, it was not leading in some of these areas and many of these areas and sort of having an opportunity to understand what resonated with people and what didn't. Uh, and uh, similarly for Amazon, uh, where it is really exciting to see a company that, you know, had its roots a little bit more in e-commerce, e really have an opportunity to try things out in AWS really have opportunity to try things out in digital businesses, introduce devices like Alexa. And so, um, and most recently I was, I've been this CTO of Samsung Smart Things, where really we're looking at IoT at Samsung across a broad range of consumer and enterprise devices. And in that, you know, again, really being able to drill down one more level where I'm really understanding components like I didn't really understand before in terms of screens and manufacturing processes and some of these things. And so when you put that all together, really has given me an opportunity to see where there's some real opportunities for synergy across all of these things. Uh, and this is what I think is a lot powering the next phase um, in really both IoT and AI, which are really co-evolving uh, because without IoT, AI has no way to really interact with the physical world. And, and so and they're really evolving in conjunction with each other, um, as you see sort of devices and, and the intelligence of those devices. Um, and so now that kind of multidisciplinary background is more and more useful because you're having intelligence out at the edge. Um, and really people aren't able to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to put it here because that's where we've had the expertise or that's what, where we've been doing it. So it's really exciting to have had that background and then find that everything's kind of come full circle now. Absolutely. And you had such a, you know, storied experience at Microsoft, Amazon, and Samsung, really focusing on consumer facing products, right? Um, and you talk a lot about intelligence within devices, but these kind of concepts are very uh, hard for normal people to grasp. The explainability of the technology is often lost to them, right? Um, you know, they may, they may be really enjoying the user experience, but maybe they don't know why, you know, the Apple Watch just told them to stand up or, um, why some of the technologies are making the recommendations that they do. Um, in that kind of uh, lens, right, what are some things that everyday people uh, don't know about their smart devices that they should? So I think pretty much everybody would say this, but I'm going to give some context to it. Obviously, um, the challenge is your smart device is a connected device, and so it brings with it a lot of security problems. And, and in that, um, you know, one of the things people have to remember is actually – IoT is not nearly as young as you might imagine. Um, you know, things like the Roomba vacuum go back to 2002, but actually there were wireless garage door remotes in the 80s um, and self-timing ovens and stuff like this. And, and in particular, people say, well, why do I care, Robert? I mean, those weren't connected in a digital way. Well, actually, one of the things that you can do with your TV remote that's, um, you know, infrared is I can now, because it's a connected device, unlock your door maybe. And so... Uh, actually, you have this huge set of legacy that sort of come in and, you know, created um, uh, a real management challenge. And these older devices, they have a fairly limited shelf life in terms of being updated. That old router is just a huge problem for your house. Um, and and it's because now it's it's much more critical. Before, you know, if it's if it's really just supporting your computers, it's not quite the attack surface it's now become. So a lot of that is thinking through um, this discrepancy and why it's especially a discrepancy is the number one buying reason for IoT devices is security and peace of mind. 
So 60% of purchases are security related. There are things like the locks, alarms, cameras. And so, you know, then, then you're sitting there going, wow, I've got, you know, a, a discrepancy here between what's actually deployed um, and the whole reason that people were doing this. Uh, and it's slightly fueled by one other thing, which is about one third of all purchases are people between 25 and 35 years old. Uh, and so you also have a whole bunch of people who interact with these devices that aren't primary on it. So they're even less aware. And, and so because of this, I think that you've seen uh, a lot of changes recently and new regulation has come out. Um, governments are starting to get involved. They're, they're realizing that consumers have a challenge. And um, you know, it's, there are two sides to that challenge, even security and privacy, both. And so I think that that's you know, one of the things that people need to really think about with respect to their smart devices. First of all, you, you probably want to upgrade to ones that have a better security profile. People have fought through this. Uh, and then you really think about some of the privacy implications because those devices weren't designed around them, uh, much like it's you know, like running Windows 3.1 now. <laughs> run an old operating system, it wasn't really thinking about security or privacy in the same ways. Definitely. You know, one of the technologies that's often touted as uh, a, maybe a solution or a partial solution to the security and cha privacy challenge you're talking about is blockchain. But we know that blockchain and decentralization is not a panacea. It's not going to solve all of our problems, but maybe it does have a future within the IoT. At least IoTechs definitely think so. Um, where do you see the opportunities for decentralized uh, decentralization in IoT, and more importantly, how can decentralized systems match the centralized systems of today? So I think that one thing is we should really talk about the opportunity for blockchain broadly, and then I'll sort of talk about it sort of specifically. There are a number of problems in IoT that blockchain sort of uniquely positioned to help. So one of the big problems is that you really want to verifiably share data um, without coupling or bottlenecks. And, uh, and so, you know, with that scalability and trust are some of the biggest problems that you have in, in IoT. Um, second problem that's sort of related to that is that these are big complex systems and, you know, you would like to have good failure isolation. And so when you look at all these scalability and fragility issues, um, blockchain provides an opportunity to really uh, control that. So you can have a set of immutable data um, you can control the optics in, in a set of ways. Uh, and this really takes things forward because um, for all the consumers and consumers of the data, you have all these different stakeholders. Um, today, mostly they interact with APIs and that's kind of a fragile way to do this. And so one of the other things blockchain does is through the implementation uh, actually creates a much stronger contract, both combination of kind of ledgering and sharing of those ledgers where you'll have a set of uh, immutable data um, which multiple stakeholders are interested in, and they're interested in the verifiable accuracy of it. Um, and, uh, and you know, the other problem they have in IoT is sort of overtrust. So you really want to have small, relatively untrusted devices. Uh, and so when we look at all those spaces and all the places that can contribute, you know, one of the questions that people have is, is, is where and how and how quickly. And, you know, that's where we're going to, start seeing it. I think there are some places where, you know, it's, it's immediately uh, applicable and you're going to start to see that. So in, in particular, an example is anything that involves commerce. So an example, you might have an insurance company and it wants to incent the behavior that you actually lock your door every time you go out to turn on the alarm. And if you do that, they'll lower your insurance rate by some amount. Um, and, you know, you're seeing a lot of cases like this where they had a business reason, actuarial reason to be able to have that behavior because they need to actually have the change in <laughs> really towards to be able to pass that on to the, to the customer. At the same time, they can't control all the devices that are out there. And the opportunity is you're seeing a pushback both from consumers who are saying just because you're my cloud service doesn't mean sort of like your ISP being able to control your data or your house. No, I can provide a URL and go where I want. Uh, and this is something that you know, is sort of the next stage of IoT. Customers are starting to demand more and more of it. Of course, the service providers are less interested in doing it. Um, and so a technology will evolve that lets you sort of manage the fragmentation and the fragility and the sharing. You know, blockchain really allows you to do this. So 
What I'm looking forward to is that because there are a number of these shared um, data cases, shared contract cases, uh, you're going to start seeing a technical solution. And it, it's pretty clear that it will share some of these characteristics. Uh, now then the question is, is what companies and how, and that's where I think it uniquely benefits people who look at it from a platform perspective, because this is clearly a platform problem. Uh, and then it will become something where, you know, customers are going to pick, uh, just like David Sovereignty, um, the companies that they uh, both trust the most and have the most appealing and adoptable solutions to them. Uh, so overall, uh, definitely IoT won't evolve without solving some of these problems. It's sort of gotten about as far as it can get um, in the monolithic silos. Um, you know, one of the things that has been a huge trend in 2020 is, uh, you know, the, the bad people have noticed. And so they got into overdrive. So did, um, attacks on enterprises are up 3x, attacks on Homer up 8x year over year. Uh, and so that's where I see this huge, you know, real opportunity is that uh, it won't be solved by those vendors. Like I said, HP is not going to solve that. They're going to be really slow to adopt these things. Um, but at the same time, the enterprises are totally thinking about it because they're like, oh my God, I don't have a person on site who can react. My old way was I phone up Jane or Joe, who's a local IT person, and tell them to turn off all the HP printers, like whatever. Um, but that's, um, that's not the case. And uh, so that's, I think, will be big part of like 2021 and a huge opportunity because like I said, the companies aren't expecting HP. Like they, they, the old way would be in a non COVID world, they would have gone back to HP to solve this They'd say, you guys got to solve this. I've got this problem. You know, if nothing else, send your HP person to sit out of my company or whatever. Um, but now that since they know that's not an option, then they're really open. They'll say, Hey, I'll take biotechs or someone else. Yeah, no, I, I, I think even, you know, we talked a lot about from the enterprise perspective, but I talked to a lot of uh, our users, right, of UCAM and things that... Same thing. I mean, you know, users, same thing where, and, and they're more powerless to some extent because and their homes have been attack services and they're, you know, they never wanted to manage. I mean, this is part of why you had enterprise devices and everything else. Um, and this is sort of like what I call v B BYOD phase two, too. And there's sort of two parts to it. So one is... It was BYOD, bring your own device in reverse because basically you've got these work devices sitting in your home networks, sharing your home networks and potentially you know, accessing data that you didn't want to know. I'll give you some like, concrete examples that people have given me that they're really unhappy about is people at Microsoft and Google are really unhappy that their computers monitor you know, how productive they are at home and what else they're doing. And so it'll count, you know, you had 57 minutes in Word, but oh, I noticed you browsed like YouTube for it's like you shouldn't know like well, what I'm doing on my home computer for God's sake, or it'll capture you know your daughter's time or whatever. Um, and uh, and so all of this sort of brings like these new use cases for and this new awareness of like, oh my God, I want to take back my data. I want to under like I want to be able to tell my company what it can watch. Okay, I'll put my work laptop into work mode now, and then maybe you can watch some set of stuff. But you shouldn't be go pinging my network and like doing all of the fun things that you you were quite able to do when you were in the enterprise. And so I've seen this tension a lot and nobody has any tools for it because the home wasn't designed for this at all. It was designed for wide open, total sandbox, UPMP, do whatever. And um, and so then, you know, it's so this is where then you sit there and go, well, then people want products that do that. So this is where UCAM's excited. You sit there and go, great. My stuff not touching this. It's like a black hole to them. Yeah, I just feel the receptiveness of, you know, we've tried a lot of different narratives uh, through the media and things like that, but the one that seemed to re really be clicking, and maybe this was a snowball effect with, you know, the, the things you see in the headlines actually affecting people personally now, right? And I think that right. was a big shift. Um, but it's about, you know, blockchain, not just blockchain, but technology as the truth, right? Like blockchain was always touted as uh, decentralized finance uh, for payments and asset exchange, but there's been so much talk within the industry about blockchain being like a first for payments, next for truth. It was, you know, applicable in that area, but actually like way better were some of these other use cases, which held back a little bit the adoption. But I think that now, like you're saying, people are start like the immutable record 
uh, of things is starting to become appealing. The fact that, um, you know, I actually can control like my distributed share of it. So it's not like both, both from a bottleneck and from a data sovereignty perspective, um, those things are, are really starting to appeal to people. Um, so then, you know, I think that it, it will change people's perception. Um, I also blame the VCs for this because uh, they didn't understand it in any way beyond transactions. And so they just, all they did was hype it up and then people think blockchain transactions. Yeah. Turn from a, yeah, like a ledger to a computing engine, right? It, it, the equivalent would have been making AWS about e-commerce. Like it, it's sort of like, you know, this would be like, no, you can have scalable CPU memory, hard disk, whatever network. And they'd be like, ah, no, it's just so you can use a whole bunch of transactions like that. And then it gets sort of would have gotten pigeonholed. But um, but I see that it's breaking now. So that's why I think, you know, 2020 and more properly 2021 will be exciting is that finally we're breaking out of this little pigeonhole of it. Definitely. Definitely. We see the opportunity to become a verifiable data as a service for the entire industry is kind of where IOTEX is heading, in my opinion. Um, but starting with the foundational parts of trusting the devices, trusting the data, trusting the insights, and then offering those insights to other networks. Yeah, I think that um, this is the right path because you know what I'd use as an example um, would be Apache Kafka and sort of go back to 2012 at LinkedIn. And so they're sort of having streams of data and then everybody was doing the data lake thing, which didn't work very well. And so, you know, when you sat there and said, it's like, oh, no, actually, you know, people have right of it MQ or whatever, but they've, they've got like these, all these ways to sort of manage streaming. But if I can introduce the technologies, so I can do streaming of, of things in one way. And then you sort of watch Kafka take off um, uh, because of that in enterprises. I think we'll see this exact same, you know, that parallel. And the only way you had that, though, was they had to sort of see LinkedIn have this across you know, a whole bunch of systems and that gave people the confidence to say, oh yeah, I'll give this a try because, you know, if they can do it uh, across all those systems. Um, and so you're saying the same thing, oh, it works for this camera, works, you know, I can see these things. Then, um, you know, I think that you you will have a similar adoption vector. Um, and it's and it's this problem that, you know, you're not, you've looked at it and sort of broadly speaking, databases sort of streaming things like Kafka. And then, then sort of blockchain as, you know, sort of some verifiable shared ledger that you have, um, you know, enterprise will go through those. Like they're, they'll, they'll sit, sit there and say, I need to pick the stuff that goes lives in that, but they'll need to do that. Um, the big problem that I see um, for the enterprises is now they're having to share this data. And like you said, they have two problems in sharing the data. One problem is like all the regulatory stuff, especially since privacy is much more key than it ever has been. Um, and second, like the way that everybody's done it is through APIs. And that really doesn't work out for people because then they have these rules that they know they can't enforce. Oh, you must delete the data in 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. good luck proving that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so that's where, you know, you're sort of sure that something like this will happen because um, the use cases are just going up. You have more and more of this starting to happen between enterprises. Uh, enterprises have to, you know, share parts of the data. Um, and then I see the accelerant to that being COVID because you're sort of having these things like delivery at home. And, and so you can, people consume like a whole thing. Like, for example, I'm on a business trip and my house is getting a new TV. Um, but, you know, that meant that it needed the wall install guy who wasn't part of the television that's being installed. So Samsung is the provider of the TV. Um, uh, you'll have, I bought it through Costco. So Costco is the person who's actually sort of delivering that. Um, and, um, you know, you've got delivery network person and, and stuff like this. And then you've got the set top box, it's got it hooked in and blah, 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 blah. But there are five or six companies involved and they all want to sort of have some notification, including like the FedEx person who, you know, delivered it. And, uh, and that's where, uh, you know, right now, uh, it's amusing. I mean, it's actually a person. So this person like grabs a tracking number, copy paste it over here from here to over there and, and does this, but, um, but they're seeing the scalability of that. So cool times, uh, very exciting what biotech is doing. Yeah. You know, one thing that 
uh, really caught my attention that you said is the desire for even uh, everyday corporations and even small to medium businesses to hold on to customer data is shifting from being an asset to now being a liability with things like GDPR and CCPA as those privacy demands uh, increase. But everyday people and businesses owning their data and being self-sovereign sounds great, but it also has its uh, pros and cons, right? On one hand, it brings self-sovereignty and control. On the other hand, it pushes the burden of custody to uh, less experienced users. Uh, so how do you feel about this dynamic evolving in the near term and the long term? Like, will, will customers and everyday consumers really be ready to hold their data or uh, is this gonna be uh, a thing that we never see? So I think there's a couple of things. Uh, there's even some technical challenges that are riding into this as well. So there are lots of technical reasons why you're going to see more data at the edge um, for a large variety of, of, of reasons. Um, you know, beyond, you know, I'll take healthcare as an example where uh, there was, you know, kind of a reason to do it for processing and other reasons, like you'd say, and sort of data sovereignty reasons. But guess what? Now as they're starting to look at some of the amounts of data they'd have to move around um, and you know some of the practical considerations actually they have to have certain devices to be able to just handle data locally because it's just a scale to do anything else and so with that you start to say okay actually you're gonna have a set of primitives that go across this and it's work a lot like a bank account where I want to be able to move funds yeah. each place still want to actually be able to have a set of guarantees um, uh, that are you know there and in place for me and so, you know, in particular, uh, give you sort of one concrete example is a lot of people feel like when they're talking about like voice in their home, their sense of voice interactions and voice data, they don't want to leave in their home. And, you know, then they'd like to understand that that really happened. It's kind of like, you know, the simplest form, form of this is pressing the red mute button and, you know, having a visual cue or similar to what you sort of see with webcams when they have their green light and turn on at you and things like this. But in there, you're going to see that not just, so this is something that started in the device space. And I'm using an analogy to what, how you're going to see this in, in the data space. People want that. And, and you know, we will have a set of guarantees, kind of like you can keep your phone number as you move between providers. And um, what you're seeing is actually the cloud providers are also seeing this and supporting federations. So Amazon has its outposts and, you know, other cloud providers have similar things so that you're actually going to get to a situation where, um, you'll have this federation, but you're really dealing with the same primitives. And, um, you know, examples, I know many companies who use an S3 API locally. And, um, and so with this, it's definitely this trend where people want to be able to make those choices. And they don't want to pay for something that they don't have to do. So IoT was one of the first places where it was seen. You'd have these devices generating huge streams of data. And just because of the way the infrastructure worked, that all go up to the cloud. And then they stare and say, I'm paying huge amounts of money when I just wanted summaries or um, you know, other um, things. And so, you know, one of the things that's happened is on the cloud side, they do a fairly good job. Even AI can automatically determine kind of your usage of the data and hence, you know, is it warm, cool, cold, ice cold. Uh, and but that didn't translate all the way up to the edge. Now you're starting to see this stuff move in a more fluid way. And this will be really critical um, for the next stage of things. Now, one of the things that that brings with us is this problem is you want to still understand what's going on with that data. And so you sort of need that, that meta layer because like you said, um, I actually have some of these regulations that require me kind of know everything. And so, um, you know, it doesn't matter if it was captured in edge device or or otherwise um, to the regulator. And so because of that, there's a set of, you know, audit functionality that I need everywhere. And, and this is what, you know, all of this, I think, will drive platforms because um, just like uh, commerce and PCI certification and stuff like this, you know, you, you look at these bars and you say, I can't make my piece meet all of these without consuming some set of platform technology that's uniquely good at um, meeting these bars because the bars are no longer easy um, to, uh, for, for companies to meet. It's, it's become complicated. I think the good news is companies are finally getting some of these primitives because they, before they just had to manage themselves. If you want 
private data, what would you do? Well, who knows what you did? Maybe you encrypted your database. Maybe you didn't. Maybe it was encrypted at rest. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe you had a contractor who didn't do that for a particular database file. We've seen all these stories. And uh, now the way that these companies want to operate is that you know they want to be able to have some guarantee. Is my data all protected? Um, do I am I managing the privacy appropriately um, for the you know, meet the regulations? Give customers better guarantees, uh, and so um, you know this is really sort of the next thing that's happening. And what's exciting to me is the first wave of this was all upbound to the cloud, and and now you're really seeing it go all the way back down to the edge and kind of involve all the different pieces. And you're able to use some of the same technology that really evolved when they, you know, put it all in this one place and then kind of solve it there. Um, and so that's something that's that's uh, going better and better. That being said, uh, we're a long way from solving it because one of the things that's really amazing, if you look at a lot of the devices that these enterprises use, um, you know, I was looking at a card key reader the other day uh, that someone, because of COVID, wanted to make some modification to and realized that its firmware hadn't been updated since 2017 and it had a number of known attacks uh, that that you could apply to it. So really, actually, the physical security was to some extent compromised. It's going to take a while for we, we for us to be able to go all the way from edge um, to cloud. But this is something that is now becoming an option for companies. And they knew that, you know, like you said, the bespoke option wasn't, you, you don't want to sort of like you had a choice of either going back to old school craftsmanship or, or using machine parts. You still want to use machine parts, even if you're putting them together. And, and so that's something that is really exciting now is you have options to do that. Companies are starting to do that. It is important to them. Absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, really, really great insights. I think the, the theme around all of the questions that we've mentioned is, you know, whether it's for privacy or it's for regulation or it's for just great user experience, there's going to be a lot of data out there. And with so much data out there being generated by edge devices, one question a lot of people have is, how do we establish a single version of the truth? Uh, not just for direct uses of our data, but even indirect uses to train machine learning models. We all know about mm -hmm. adversarial examples and how they can really mess up even the, the stack, right, from platform to model to edge, edge device that uses the model. So in the ongoing war against information, we hear all these horror stories in our elections with COVID. Uh, how do you think technology can help? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, what you've pointed out is actually you're seeing uh, all the use cases evolve in real time of cases where people want to be able to verify facts. And... This can be simple business facts like monthly active users, daily active users, the engagement of these users, all those other metrics. But overall, any one of these is a claim that's being made and you want to be able to verify dispute um, and audit you know, that claim. And I think that we're starting to get more and more careful about those things. One of the things that's great is because of the technology that we have, we can look at data that's semi-clean. So an example that you brought up, if you look at news sources and some of these other ones, you can be using NLG to basically be able to understand the intent of what was going on from that into something that you could um, verify or not verify. Um, but most broadly, you look at the business use cases for this, it's huge. So it's not just, hey, I think it would be great to solve this because of how people consume information on a personal level. Actually, it's more important for businesses uh, because they're making decisions based on these things. And often in your partnerships, uh, you'll have that, you know, it'll be a, a box you're supposed to do X and deliver X. And, um, you know, one of the challenges has always been, well, like, how do I measure that? And so now um, I think that we have more and more tools that allow us to establish these facts and then make it very ver verifiable. And obviously blockchain is one great technology for being able, the ability to sort of audit, audit the ledger and really uh, understand how, how those facts were established. Um, but you're seeing that for more and more uh, processes and you know, durability is really important. People wanna go back March 5th, let's agree what happened. Oh, the service tech did come out. Um, oh, but they went to the wrong house. 
and you know the person reported it in half an hour or one hour and um so what we're seeing is more and more of the systems will do that she dovetails into one of the big opportunities for 2021 is one of the things that we're seeing in 2021 start to happen and happen sort of because of covid is how to get better about this whole idea of lining up and so instead you know you really want to be able to have someone do something like a doctor's appointment at 315 my daughter has a allergy appointment and um you know it'll be very important it is very important for for that to happen at a particular time and in order to manage that um it starts to go into all of these things where you'll sit there and go, wow, I, I really need to establish what happened when, react to some of these things. Um, and it's across, uh, you know, these set of disparate businesses. And so you start to have some of the technologies evolving now uh, that allow people to do that. And, you know, it's, it's really, this is one of the things that's really critical is that it wasn't good enough for someone to just sort of send me a message. That's why you got into these sort of Hey, your installer is going to come between nine and five, or your package is going to come on this day. Is you know that's how much you could get without an ability to start verifying those hypotheses and elements of those hypotheses and prove, audit, verify. Um, and so that's one of the big trends that's actually been exacerbated this year by by COVID is that you're seeing this develop much faster. It was kind of slowly developing um, before, but now all of a sudden, oh no. Say you have a problem with your cell phone, they'll say, "Hey, I'll give you a call back. I'm gonna I want to be able to tell you. I'm gonna call you back between 37 and 42 minutes, and I have to hit that window. And what are all the things that have to enable me to do that? Um, so this is really emerging, and I think you'll see a lot of improvement in it in 2021. That's a really interesting point you have about predictability, right? Like I've always thought about blockchain as a very proactive technology. You're writing your cell phone, tiering your data to the chain to kind of cover your butt and later you don't have to go through the reactive litigation and things like that. And definitely a trend in 2021 to see more truth. And, you know, just to close, uh, what are some of the other big trends that you see when it comes to our smart devices or how users use smart devices? The 2021 is going to be a pretty big year because a lot of things are starting to come to fruition that have been kind of long augured um, and they're not going to snap over, but, um, they're starting to get adopted and they'll work together. So one of them, 5G, people have talked about for a really long time, but it's actually finally starting to go out. And it's not going to immediately give that panacea of connectivity that we were saying, um, but it is going to start to push things. Simultaneously with that, you've got satellite and a few other low-power connectivity options that are also coming out in my first quarter of 2021. We're going to start to see this. And so, um, uh, and you've got a new Wi-Fi standard that's started to come out and it's going to pick up some momentum and so all these things mean that local connectivity is is actually gradually improving um still going to be fragmented but um and you know that's sort of one side of it is the adoption is finally there and then the other side of it is the needs there so um covid has been a catalyst for a bunch of interesting things i mean a lot of people have talked about the obvious ones like digital and remote health um, but some of the more interesting ones is that it actually demonstrated to enterprises that remote monitoring, like in manufacturing and in other areas, they saw the value. All of a sudden, because I couldn't send that person in, and then I had this, and then they realized the value, now they're doubling down. And and so then when they want to double down, actually one of the things that's holding them back on doubling down is some of the activity I was sort of talking about. So there's sort of this opportunity, but you're seeing this huge movement in things that were being slowly adopted. And it's similar to sort of workplaces. Um, you know, there was a certain amount of workplace automation, but now as I'm sure that I'm only going to have people in three days of the office or two days of the office on an ongoing basis that are, you know, working from home is going to be a for sure thing. Then all of these things in smart lighting in terms of enterprises um, and, you know, those types of things that were on this really slow adoption curve has sort of kicked them up into high gear. Um, third big trend that's happening is that lots of stuff in measurements finally sort of taking off. So this is, you know, LIDAR is finally here for consumer devices, but you're starting to see things that are getting a lot smarter in terms of the position. I know it's on top of the table. I don't know roughly where it is. It's not the, hey, the only way I can find things is have that device beep at me. Um, I'm now getting a lot more spatial intelligence and AR, VR is good enough that you can do things like measure things now. And then because of LIDAR, you're actually getting a precision measurement. Uh, and so all of that is sort of 
work together in a way where you're going to finally see uh, a lot of these things where remote is much more feasible. Um, and, and it's sort of required for some of these use cases. But examples are companies where you can have a quote on your roof um, by just taking help pictures of your house and things like that. And um, obviously, it's, it's better with some devices. But this is where these use cases are really um, using this catalyst of COVID in the same way that you're seeing things in, in terms of healthcare where remote diagnostics are really important, remote health is really important, digital health is is, is, is more critical uh, because you're going to much less. Um, uh, the other thing that's partnered up with that is all that data needs some place to go. And that's sort of where AI is starting to help. But you're having a lot of these AI algorithms that now they're telling you, are you wearing a mask? Did you wash your hands? to have the compliance on this. And again, it's being driven by this thread where it was more important that that compliance happened than ever before. Uh, so with that, you know, what's Pretty exciting about 2021 is you're seeing a lot more industrial IoT adoption. Before it was really vanilla, like it was part of a project. You might have a couple sensors that, you know, were really making sure that the machine continued to operate the way it was expected. It wasn't really driving these, you know, what I would call the digital transformation. Um, but now it's really starting to drive a digital transformation. And you're one of the things that's a little bit of challenge is that all these things are changing at the same time. So you're sitting there saying, as I, as I want to adopt something might be new in the IoT space. I want it to support things like 5G. I want it to be able to support some of the new standards. Um, and so for a company, this means that you have a lot more thinking than ever before. You sort of want to have a world-class CIO helping you make these decisions because there's more decisions than ever to be making and you're making them faster. So this starts to make a really exciting year. It's, it's going to be one where I think you're going to see um, lots of incremental changes across um, quite a few um, different areas and that's where you know for a company like iotex is is really helpful because sit there and go at that point you need these spanning technologies um, for companies and you you basically want to look at ways that you can you know bring this together and you need a high level of guarantee um, from a privacy and security standpoint uh, because the the challenge is you just won't get those in a federated way you need it uniformly Absolutely. You know, I think not quite at the singularity yet, but all of these things coming yeah. together, like you said, are really unlocking things that, you know, even maybe at the start of 2020 would have, would have never imagined. But uh, Robert, really thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights with us in the IOTEX community today. And we'll be sure to chat soon. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you.